So, um, you didn't get any lecture last week. I know you were going through withdrawals because of that. So I'm going to make up for it today. So this is a really serious topic. You may recall the first day of class, I think, I mentioned that there is a guy named Eric Verza, and he says that all project management is risk management. Anybody remember me saying that? All project management is risk management. And it's true, because remember, you're doing something that's never been done before, and the chances of it not working out are really, really high. So you have to be a master of managing risk if you want to be an effective project manager. So today, we're going to dedicate an entire lecture and there's an entire lesson on risk management. So it's, uh, it's pretty good. Now next week, we're not going to be here, right? And the following week, I'm going to talk about a certification that you can get in project management. As a matter of fact, you, you could sign up for that certification right now, today, and you could go take the test. And if you pass it, you are going to be called a certified associate in project management by the Project Management Institute. And the only requirement for to take the test is to have a high school diploma and to have um, 24 hours of classroom education, which I think we qualify because we've been doing like four hours a week and you will six times four. Once we do six weeks, you can claim 24 hours, pay for the exam and get the certification. So I'm gonna talk about that when we come back from, from uh, spring break. And that same lecture same class meeting, I'm going to give you a chance to work on your Microsoft project assignments number two and number three in class. So if you have questions you want to ask me, I'll help you. And if you can get both of those done during that class meeting, then you don't have to do anything outside of class. Isn't that awesome? I think that's pretty, pretty generous of me to give up my valuable time to help you in that way. Then after that, we have our exam the following week, I believe, next exam. So that's that's a preview of coming attractions. So hopefully it's uh, it's exciting. So let's get into our discussion about managing risk. So here's the agenda. We have um, six different objectives here. So we're going to cover all of these in the next. 45, 50 minutes. So risk management is a process. It's not an event. It's not an event. So I think starting on Thursday, we're going to have the, uh, the basketball tournament, I think. Here, is that true? And then we have March Madness. Those are events. They happen once a year and they're done. Risk management is not like that. Risk management is something that is dynamic. It's something that needs to occur on an ongoing basis. Because as you probably can imagine, risk can appear at any time, at any time. And if you're not ready to manage it, then you're gonna be in trouble. So um, now I wanna tell you that risk is, um, is something that is, it is positive or negative, positive or negative. And the reason it is, is because risk can be defined by probability, probability. So don't think that risk is always something bad. There can be upside risk, risk where something's going to turn out better than what you expect. Could that happen in a project? Sure. So don't think that it's always something bad. A lot of times it is bad, but it can be something that is good. Right? Now, what is risk management? So you're 
recognizing. So risk management is a surveillance process where you are looking for things that you did not expect. You're looking for things that you did not expect and you're going to manage them effectively. So if you took a journalism class, anybody ever take a journalism class? High school, college? Nobody? Ever? You don't want to admit to it? So there's something called the five W's and an H that maybe you recall. What, where, when, why, who, and how. Remember that? So those questions are really good to use to manage risk. So the first one is, what can go wrong? Then, if it does go wrong, how are we going to minimize its impact? And then, what can we do before it goes wrong? And then, what do we do when it does go wrong? Okay? So th this right here is really kind of at the heart of, of effective risk management. So I would encourage you to make sure that you know those things. All right, so what I did is I copied some material out of the Project Management Body of Knowledge Guide, the sixth edition, and I reproduced them here. This is not in your book, not in your book, but you have it here. So there are uh, 49 examples of inputs, tools and techniques, and outputs in the Project Management Body of Knowledge Guide. And so uh, I'm going to share um, some of those with you right now. So if you want to effectively manage risk, you need to know what are the inputs that are going to go into that plan to manage risk. Well, the first thing you have is a project charter. And everybody knows that's an internal document that you're going to develop that basically says game on. Here's what the project is all about and here's how it's going to transpire in our organization. So you have to have that. If you don't have that, you're going to be left at a disadvantage. Then you're going to make your project management plan. All components, so every single thing that you could possibly think of have to be included. Then you're going to have various documents. So you can have a register of your stakeholders. And that's going to be a list of all the people that have an, an interest or that are affected by your project. You want to know that because each of them could have a different idea about what represents risk and what does not. Then we have these two things that are pretty much present for all projects. And what this is, these are um, environmental factors. These are conditions inside and outside your company that's going to affect your project, okay? So right now, my friend that has two um, chiropractic offices, one of his chiropractors just told him, take this job and shove it. And he said that last Thursday and just walked out, no notice. Is that a good way to quit a job? No. So now my, my friend is having to go to that office and he's got to be there every day this week, which he was not planning on doing. So that is an internal condition that affected his business. You guys with me? It's inside. Now, let's say that he has trouble hiring chiropractors because they are doing something else. That's external. You with me? So you want to identify those different things how they affect your project. And then you have assets in your organization. These are things of value that are going to help you cope with these things here. You with me? So this is a good input. Then what are you going to do? Well, you're going to use your expert judgment. If you have zero experience with a project, you're going to have a hard time managing risk, aren't you? Because you're a rookie. You've never done it before. You're clueless, but if you've done it many, many times, then 
you are an expert, right? So you're gonna be able to use that judgment. Also, you're going to analyze data. You're gonna look at things quantitatively that's going to affect how you manage risk. And then you're gonna have meetings. Meetings could be just grabbing somebody in the hall and say, hey, I want, let's talk about this. Or it could be a formal meeting where you get a room full of people like this and you talk about it. So, and then when you do all those things, you're gonna have a risk management plan. This is your game plan on what you're gonna do about any risk that comes your way. So I'm hoping that this makes perfect sense. Now, as you go deeper into risk management, into the project management body of knowledge guide, you're going to get a lot more detail, a lot more detail. And remember, we said all components. Well, here you go. Here's all the components. Your scope, your cost, your resources. Here's your documents, OK? Documents, you see that? Here they are now in more detail. You're going to have some assumptions. Assumptions. You're going to have some things that you learned. Like, I don't want to ever do this again. So, um, you know, so, some of you did not um, turn in your PDF files on your Microsoft project assignment. And I don't know why you didn't do that, because I, I mentioned that was a requirement like three, four times, and 90% of you did it. I don't know why the other 10% did not. But that would be a lesson learned, like, OK, not everybody did it. What can I do differently next time? I don't think anything. Because I probably annoyed some of you by being too repetitive. Right, Dylan? Oh, yeah. Right? Was I too repetitive? Oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> so you hate me now? No, you're fine. I don't want to leave anybody behind. I want everybody to come with me, right? So sometimes you got to, like, beat things into the ground a little bit. That's it. That's just how it's done. So um, look at this. Agreements. Agreements are contracts, aren't they? So you want to look at contracts. How much risk could there be in this contract? So anyway, it's a long list, isn't it? And then now, in terms of the data gathering and the data analysis, there's a bunch more things that you can do, right? And then you still got meetings here. So when we talked about the risk management plan here, now it's going to be more detailed. A risk register. A risk register is a listing of all the things that could represent risk. Just make a list. That way you can handle it, right? And then a report. So you're going to maybe write a, write a report on it. And then you're going to make updates. So you're going to have new assumptions. You're going to have new, new issues and new lessons learned. So this is pretty good. And now, in terms of the data analysis, you're going to have qualitative data analysis and quantitative. So the qualitative um, doesn't really involve any numbers. So look, it's interviewing. It's, um, it's facilitating how the team is working. So this is coaching. Mentoring. You can also have a hierarchical chart that shows how things flow from top to bottom. So there's no data. It's all qualitative. And then, as you probably would guess, we have quantitative, too. So now you're going to do simulations. You're going to do sensitivity analysis. I think I may have talked about that. Not everything is going to have equal importance. Okay? Not everything is going to have equal importance. So you want to give the right attention to the most important things. If something is not, a, not that important, it could be a thousand times off, and it's not going to cause you any grief at all. On the other hand, if you need a chiropractor to be in your office, how sensitive is that? That's like the highest sensitivity, isn't it? Because if that chiropractor is not there, then everybody's going to have to do their own adjustment. And you, you can't adjust yourself like a chiropractor can, unless you're triple jointed to get your <coughs> arms back there and push 
on yourself on that table, that table that goes down, if you've had that adjustment, right? Oh, it felt so good. Or, or cracking your neck, you can crack your own neck. All right. Decision tree analysis. This is pretty cool. This is where you're going to show a sequence of events and you're going to have joint probabilities. You guys remember that from math class? Joint, where you have two things, three things that happen in, 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 in a series, and that's going to give you like 0.2 times 0.1 times 0.1, correct? So 0.2 times 0.1 is 0.02, and then 0.02 times 0.1 is 0. 002. Remember that? That's what I'm getting at here. So that's got low probability of happening, doesn't it? 0 0.002, that is um, two out of a thousand. You got a chance, a thousand things, only two are gonna happen. You don't worry about that at all, do you? Okay? All right, keep going. Now, your risk response. What, what can you do if risk appears? So there's inputs, tools and techniques, and outputs. Um, so look at this, this is your toes. A strategy for a threat. A strategy for opportunities. A contingency. Also, um, decision making. How do you make decisions? You're gonna make a decision using more than one variable. There's going to be multi-variables. You're going to do a cost-benefit analysis. So if you're serious about managing risk for a project, you don't need to know all these for this class. You don't need to know that. But I may ask you a general question about it, like which of these are not included? So I'll have quantitative analysis, check it, right? It's included. Qualitative, check. Contingent, check. And then I'll have a fourth one that's not there, like that's the right answer. You love those kind of questions, don't you? Okay? I could ask you that, but if you're serious about project management, I would encourage you to keep this, put it somewhere safe, so when you go to work at, a, at your first real job after college, you have this, and you'll impress your boss. He'll probably promote you on your first day. Like, where did you learn all that? Well, there was this crazy professor, Swain, not to be confused with Swain, and this is what he told us on February the 28th, 2023. Hire, hire Swain, if you think I'm good, Bring him in. You ain't seen nothing yet. All right, just a joke. Then you're going to implement your risk responses. This one is just planning them. This one is putting them into action. Look at this right here, a change request. This is very important, okay? You're not going to just unilaterally make a change or respond to a risk by yourself. You're going to have to submit a request to some authority if you're working at a company. And that authority could be a committee. And they're gonna evaluate, well, why do you wanna change this project? Well, because if we don't change it now, it's going down the tubes. And you convince them with data follow me? So there has to be a formal change request process that you have. Okay. All right. Now, going back to the book, simplifying things, summarizing. So we have, um, first of all, identify the risk. If you don't identify the risk, your chances of managing the risk are zero. And you want to find out where it's coming from. Is that important? Sure. So people are still trying to figure out where COVID came from, correct? 
They're still trying to figure it out. And to do that, you've got to go to the source. But that source is either hard to identify or impossible to identify. But as much as possible, if you can identify the source, you've got a good chance of preventing it from happening at all or again. All right, then you're going to assess the risk. Now, there's three things. How bad, how bad could it be? How, how impactful could it be? Good or bad? If it's tiny, just ignore it. If it's big, move on. How likely is it going to be to take place? And how can it be controlled? Okay, so this is your assessment. Then, your response. You want to get a strategy, look, to either reduce the possible damage or to increase the possible benefit. Did you hear what I said? You don't want to just reduce the possible damage. If it's a good thing, you want to maximize its benefit. So we should have had those words there. Now, a contingency plan is your plan B or plan C. Plan B or plan C. So I watched a program recently about these people that were stuck in the hospital during Katrina. Did you guys see that program where they couldn't get out and nobody could get to them? They were completely cut off and they, they were there for days. And they were, they were in trouble, big trouble. So after the fact, they had a lot of court cases about what could have been done differently. Now, I don't know why anybody would want to live in New Orleans. Because if you're walking down the road and you look up, what do you see? What's up there? The ocean. There's water that's higher than you are, right? Is that a good thing? No, because you know there's a possibility that water's gonna come down and flood everything. D does that ever happen? Has it ever happened? How many times? A few. A few. Will it happen again in the future? Yeah. Probably. So there, there's probably all kinds of contingency plans for that. So this is your backup plan. You will make your backup plan when you make your original project plan. You do it at the same time because you have all the information available, so that's when you want to do it. Now here's the problem. A lot of people will make a backup contingency plan at the beginning. They don't update it. They don't update it. So they put it away for a rainy day or a flood, and then the rainy day comes and they say, oh, go get your contingency plan because we can use that. And then you find out it's obsolete because it's based on old technology. Or the people that know about it, they've retired. You with me on this? It's worthless. So you got to keep your contingency plan up to date. That puts a big level of stress and strain on the project manager. But if you don't keep it up to date and you have a disaster, you're screwed, okay? So you gotta keep the contingency plan up to date. And then when you have the strategy and you implement it, then you're gonna control it because you wanna make sure that what you want to have happen does happen. Too often, people just implement a plan and they forget about it. They don't even monitor anything. And it's a disaster, okay? So th this is how you manage risk. Okay, so now we're gonna go in more detail. So identifying the risk. You're gonna have a list but to get the list, you're going to use a risk breakdown structure. 
And you're also going to develop a risk profile with questions. So when you see this diagram, this should be very familiar to you. Because what does it look like? Uh, it's not the OBS, but whatever. The work breakdown structure. You should never forget that. That's the most important tool in this whole class. This looks like a work breakdown structure, doesn't it? All we're doing now is we're just looking at where all the different risk occurrences can take place. That's it. So again, once you have the work breakdown structure understood, you want to leverage your application of that by using variations of it for other parts of your project. So the risk breakdown structure will do that for you. And then here's the risk profile. So going back, so here's technical, external, here's technical, right? All you're doing is you're going to these different areas and you're asking a bunch of questions. Because you must have the answers to these because this is going to tell you how well you have managed risk. Okay? Look at this. Ambiguities in definitions. So people look at different terms different ways. Could that be a problem? Yeah, the example that I gave you before is the word nowhere. Nowhere. What's another way of defining that term? Now, here. Now, here, and nowhere, they're opposites, aren't they? Nowhere means it doesn't exist. Now, here means it's, it exists and it's right here. I know that's a silly example, but that's what I'm talking about. So make sure that everybody understands things the same way. Here, here's a good one. Do people work cooperatively cooperatively across functional boundaries. That means, do people work together in teams? Yes or no. If they don't work together in teams, it's going to be hard for you to manage risk because everyone's going to be doing their own thing. Here, look at this one. Is authority clear? Will we have testing equipment when we need it? So this is a great list that goes into your risk profile. Okay, step two, assessing your risk after you identify it. So you're going to do something called a scenario analysis, and you're going to tell a story about if we have this kind of risk, here's the story. If we have that kind of risk, here's the story. So that, that's what's going to happen there. And then you're going to um, come up with this form that I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, and you're going to have a severity matrix. This, this is an awesome tool that um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and take a minute and talk to you about this. So I'm going to write this on the board. Let's say that we're um, manufacturing a new type of bicycle. You know, we have the electric bike, and now let's say we get another kind of a bike. And the worst thing that can happen to you when you're going downhill on a bike, 40 miles an hour, is for you to lose the adjustment on your seat. So you need the seat to be high, because you have long legs, and while you're going down here, that seat goes from high all the way down to nothing. That could cause great bodily harm for you in a number of ways. You catch my drift? That could hurt you in a place where you don't want to be hurt, and it could cause you to go flying over the handlebars. You're airborne, right? So let's say that we, for our new bicycle, we want to assess the probability of that seat losing its adjustment while we're going downhill. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, identify the severity we're going to do the probability and the probability of detection. And for each of these, we're going to have 1 to 10. So let's say the severity, if it happens, 
is, let's say it's a, a seven. Okay? Seven. So it's pretty severe. The probability of it happening is a two. Not very likely. Because when we put it in, we're going to have a really good locking mechanism that's not going to come undone. And the probability of detecting it, if it does happen, we'll say that is a three. So it's, it's very likely we're going to detect it. So what you do is you multiply these together. So we get 42. Okay? Everybody see that? Now, the worst thing could be is a 10, right? If this happens, it's going to kill you. And it's very likely it's going to happen. And it's very likely that we're not going to be able to detect, detect not detect. Okay? So, this one's got a score of what? A thousand. That's right. And then, these could be ones. So what's our score here? One. So, going back to that, rich, that risk register that we talked about here, or here, you're going to identify every single thing that can turn out differently for your project. You follow me? Good or bad, but primarily bad. This is all bad here. Then, what you're going to do is you're going to evaluate the score. If it's a thousand, how much risk management do you need for that? A little or a lot? A lot. If it's one, you ignore it. This one's a 42. So this is pretty low, isn't it? So that's how you use failure mode and effects analysis. And each of these numbers, they're called a risk priority priority number. And I'm talking about these numbers right here. This is your RPN, risk priority number. Okay? Everybody understand that? I could ask you some questions on the test someday about it. I want to caution you though, there's one overriding exemption from this. If this is a one, I'm sorry, if this is a 10, this is a one, and this is a one, our score is 10, right? But if, it's, if it happens, it could kill someone, do you think you'd want to use some good risk management on that, even though these are low? Yeah. So don't just go by the score. Take a look at this number for severity. Got it? It's impact. They call it impact, I call it severity, same thing. Everybody with me on that? Okay, good. Now, probability analysis, statistical form, okay, statistical techniques. So here, here's a, another way to look at your um, impact. And this is good because this one, instead of one to 10, it's one to five, and you're forced to say, why is it a one, and why is it a five? So you're forced to do that. So this is a nice, if you don't want to do this, you can do this. So there's different approaches. And the, the reason why I'm telling you there's different approaches, you can go to a company that doesn't do this, but they do this, and I want you to know what it is so you don't look like a deer in the headlights. So here, here's another uh, way to do it. So likelihood, impact, same thing. So just taking this and having it in a different format. And then you can do it with color. Color coding is awesome. I highly recommend you use color coding for as many things as you can and use 
red, yellow, green. Because people are busy and they don't want to spend a lot of time looking through a lot of data. So if you can come up with a chart that has red, yellow, green, management's only going to look at the red. And that's what happens here. So we got high impact, high likelihood, so red. You can take this and you can make color for this too, okay? All right, so step three, we talked about well, what kind of responses could you have? The first one is mitigation. Mitigation just means to reduce. Reduce, reduce it. You may not be able to eliminate it, but you can reduce it to an imperceptible level. Here's one, avoid it. Just don't do that. Oh, if you're buying something from China and there's been a problem with that in the past, don't buy it from China. Buy it from Vietnam. You know, a lot of Chinese production now is going to Vietnam, so buy from Vietnam. You avoid the risk completely. You transfer it. This is a good one. You know, when you have car insurance, you're transferring your risk to someone else. So um, my, my daughter just totaled her vehicle, okay? It's completely trashed. And she also ran into something before she totaled it. If I didn't have insurance on that vehicle, it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars lawsuit. Okay, but I didn't have to pay anything. I got money back because I've been paying in. That's the beauty of insurance. You're transferring your risk from you to the other party. A more practical example in a project is a fixed price contract. So let's say that um, I want to have a a swimming pool installed in my backyard and the company that I hire they say we'll do everything you need for 50 grand all right 50 grand good let's say that they run into problems they start to dig and they find a big piece of granite so I'm up in ball ground and you know there's a bunch of granite up there it used to be like the granite center of Georgia so they find a big slab of granite and it's going to cost them another 20 grand to get rid of it. Sorry, I'm going to pay you 50 grand. The risk is on you. You follow me? Because it's a firm price contract. Now, if they did the project and it only cost them 20 grand, I'm not going to tell them you got to kick back some money they make that money, right? So, that, so that's what happens with that. Escalating risk. If you work in a company and you have a project that's not gonna work out and it's gonna bankrupt the company, you best contact your boss and get some help. And then the last one is you just retain the risk. You know what? I'm, I'm not worried about this. So just let it ride. I, I'm just going to accept the risk. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to do anything different. I'm just going to keep going and hope for the best. Is that a smart way to, to run a business, you think? No. But some people, that's what they decide to do. Okay, contingency plan. We've talked about that. Alternatives. Plan of action. It'll be used if a possible risk event becomes a reality. It may not happen for three years. That's when you're going to use it. It's got to be ready. Okay? If you don't have one, you're going to have to look at this. Panic. You guys like to go into a panic mode? Is that a good feeling? We've, we've all expressed it. We've all done it before, haven't we? It's like, oh my gosh, there's a final exam, and it's 
going to happen in five minutes. And I'm 30 minutes from campus. I forgot about it. You ever, have, you ever go through that? Something similar? Where you, that your stomach gets all knotted up? You don't want to go into panic mode. You don't. You do not. Because what kind of decisions do you make when you're in panic mode? Terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Because you may accept the first thing. Like, oh, here's what you need to do. OK, I'll do it. Oh my gosh, that was a bad decision. But you're desperate, aren't you? You're making a decision under pressure. And look at this. It could be dangerous. Dangerous. OK? And costly. Don't do that. Do this. But this takes time, doesn't it? I'm too busy. You know that old saying, you can pay me now, or what is it? You can pay me now, or pay later. me later. And when you pay later, you pay more. You pay a lot more. You don't want to pay more later. Bite the bullet and pay now. Put it into place. So you got it. It's a, it, it, you, put, you put it away in case you need it. OK, and then you can come up with a, a matrix on how you would respond. So what are the different things? And then what's going to trigger you to do it? And who's going to do it? This is a great chart, really good. So um, there's technical risk, there's schedule risk, there's cost risk, there's money risk. Funding risk. So these are the things that can happen to you. Um, somebody did not turn in their assignment. I mean, for, for those of you that got 100%, and there's a lot of you, was it a hard assignment, honestly? Come on. You should give me those points back. Uh, but some, some, someone didn't do it. And you know what they said? My computer broke. My computer won't work. Can you give me a couple more days? Is that a good, good thing to happen? What are some of the things that could have been done to prevent that? Go to the library. What's another thing? Don't wait until last the last minute. Hello? I told you about that. That's procrastination right there. No, don't wait till the last minute. How about having a backup computer? You know how many computers I have? I have three laptop computers and a Chromebook and a tablet and a phone. I'm riding high. I'm never going to be out, out in the dark because my computer's broken. I can't afford to be without a computer. Can you guys be? No. So that's messed up. You can't have that. Technology fails. They will fail you. Right now, i got a touch screen. If anybody can fix this, I'll be, I'll be a happy man. i got a touch screen computer, and all of a sudden, the touch screen quits working. It'll just quit working. Anybody use a touch screen computer? You become dependent upon it. You're just like, right? You don't want to use that stupid pad or a mouse. So I turn it off and turn it back on, and guess what? It works. Rebooting the computer will make it work sometime. Sometimes it just sits, and they'll start working. And I've tried everything. Now, you may know that there's drivers for your computer, sound, sound drivers, uh, that touch pad for your Mouse, the, those are from the computer manufacturer. The touch screen, it's a Windows driver. It's not from the manufacturer. And for some reason, I've, I've deleted that Windows driver, and it'll come back. So it's intermittent. But I got another computer with a touch screen, and guess what? It never doesn't work. So I got a backup. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about this next time. 
a lecture crashing. That doesn't mean crash and burn. That means we're going into the, the schedule and we're going to do some things to get it back on track. More people, more money, more resources, more whatever. That's crashing it. You can do that. Okay? Or we've talked about this before, start to start, where you have two things happening at the same time. Remember that? So I'm, I'm working on the fire pit in the back. So if somebody goes to Home Depot while somebody's digging, you do it at the same time. That, that's a way to address the schedule risk. Use the best people. The tasks that are the most riskiest, use the best people to get it done right. Um, always manage your costs because you know, they can go up or down. How much is a carton of eggs right now at the market? Anybody know? Huh? Not ten bucks. Ten bucks for a carton? A dozen eggs? Is it ten bucks now? No. No. I think it's like five. Yeah. I'm going today. I'll look. I got a bunch of eggs because my nephew has chickens at Lay, so they bring them over. I should maybe start selling them on the corner. Fifty cents an egg. And then you may not have enough money. Your company is going bankrupt. They don't have any money. Okay. So you need to get some more money. Okay, now, so far we've been talking about problems. You can also have opportunities. An opportunity can be a good thing. So here's good things. So um, exploit. You want to um, do something to make sure that good thing happens. You can share the risk. You can. Um, do something to make the positive thing more likely. Um, you could tell top management, hey, we can do more of the project, but I need some more money. You give me a dollar, and I'll give you 10 back for it. You follow me? Top management needs to then cut you some money so you can then do even more. And you have to be willing to accept the opportunity. So these are ways of making the project better. Contingency, already talked about that. Um, time buffer. So to minimize risk, you may need more time. More time. Are people going to be happy if you tell them it's going to take me another month to finish this project? Yeah. Well, let's say it's on the critical path. But you tell them, look, if I do it now, chances are it's not going to work. So what would you say, yes or no? Do you, do you want a project delivered today that doesn't work? Or do you want to wait a month for one that does work? Okay, so yeah, use time. Now, I want to talk to you about some reserves. Okay, this is a great diagram. So hopefully you guys will understand it. So the original project was going to cost $1.42 million. But you say, you know what? We may need another $15,000 for design, another $80,000 for coding, another $2,000 for testing. So let's add $97,000 extra. You guys with me on that? So you do that. So now you go from here to here, because you add 97. But the management, management's been, this isn't their first rodeo. They've been, they've been around this block more than once. They said, you know what? We get it, 97,000 more, but we're gonna kick in another 50,000 just in case. You got that? This 50,000 is random, isn't it? They didn't add it to these three. They just gave it to you kind of a, a big slush fund. So that's a management reserve. These are called contingency or budget reserves. You see the difference? Because they're specific for the task. You guys got it? So both are possible. Okay, step four, your risk register, all the things that you're gonna do. How you're going to control? 
here's your process of, of putting through a change. It's not that hard to understand, so I'm going to just move on. Then you're going to have a log. Okay, this is really good. Look, here's the uh, item number, the description of the change. It's going to be supported by documents. This is the date that uh, we received the change. Here's the date that we approved it. Here's how much it cost. Here's the status. Here's the comments. Okay? This is great. This is really good. This is going to tell everybody what is going on with risk management. So um, I encourage you to have something like this. And then we come to the dreaded black screen. 